two things that were kind of, and, and it kind of confused me. I don't know if okay. he was a politician or if it was because he was has this impending death looming on his mind, but the way that he handles the requests of people as he interacts with them, how he kind of just puts it off to the side, how he kind of blows it off just a little bit, you know, but gets okay. a politician answer. You're, you're talking about the man with the wings. Right. Okay. And what is it about, what, um, show me specifically what you're pointing to here. Can you take me to the passage you're talking about? Yeah. Um, Are you talking about the bit on page 357, near the middle of the page, the miracles? That. No. Okay, can you give me a okay, yeah, yeah, description yeah, of what it is you're trying to find? Okay, yeah, can you... Okay, can you read that bit for us, please, then? Okay, just that big, long paragraph? Uh, no, just the part that you're focusing on here. Okay. Um. It's right here in the middle. It says, uh, it starts in the middle, then it goes to the end of the paragraph. It says, while she's still practically a child, she'd sneak out of her parents' house to go to a dance while she was coming back to uh -huh. the woods. Uh, coming back through the woods after having danced all night without permission. A fearful thunderclap rent the sky to do the crack and a lightning bolt of brimstone that changed her into a splatter. Mm -hmm. Her only nourishment came from the meatballs that charitable souls chose to toss into her mouth. Mm -hmm. A spectacle like that full of so much human truth and with such a fearful lesson was bound to defeat with even trying that of a haughty angel who scarcely deigned to look at mortals. Besides the few miracles attributed to the angel showed a certain mental disorder like the blind man who didn't recover his sight but grew three new teeth or the paralytic who didn't need to walk but almost won the lottery, and the leper who soars proud of sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Those consolation miracles, which were more like mocking fun, had already ruined the angel's reputation when the woman who had been changed into a spider finally crushed him completely. That was how Father Gonzaga was cured forever of his insomnia, and Paleo's courtyard went back to being as empty as during the time it had rained for three days and crowded walked through the bedrooms. Okay, so can we fit this... Idea of the haughty angel and the consolation miracles into some larger pattern or discourse. Now you said you thought this looked political to you, right? Do we see other things in the narrative here that might connect the angel in some way to politics? Do we see any things that might connect? Any other things that might connect? Let's start smaller here. That might connect to the incomprehensibility of the uh, angels' miracles, right? They're not useful. They're just weird. Can we even be sure that the angel caused these things to happen? They just happened to people who saw the angel, right? So what else do we know about the angel that might go along with these weird and comprehensible miracles? Can the angel actually communicate with anybody in the village? Yeah, doesn't speak the language, right? So no one knows what the hell the angel is saying. Did they speak Latin or was that just Father? Father Gonzaga speaks Latin. Why does Father Gonzaga speak Latin? It's the language of God. Well, he says it's the language of God, right? Why does he think it's the language of God? Because he's a Catholic priest, right? So he assumes, based on a pre-existing belief of his own, right, that angels must understand Latin. And this angel doesn't. Right? or whatever it is, doesn't understand Latin.
Yeah, Kibriana. Um, so I'm playing 3, uh, 3, 3, 3, 4, 3, 6, 5. Uh-huh. Um, um, it's like, but when they went out to the courtyard with the first line on, uh -huh. they found the whole neighborhood and brought everything, chicken coop, had fun with the angel, without those nice reverence. Uh-huh. Tossing him things to eat through the openings in the light, and if he was not supernatural, too, she was like, basically. Uh-huh. Like, I feel like they kind of, like, mocking him, because yeah. being the priestess and believe he's what everybody else is. Everybody's, like, kind of, like, you know, supernatural mm -hmm. thing. Not, yeah. Oh, it's not real. It's one way to another way. So they're trying to prove it. I feel like they're trying to like, mock me. Yeah, and if, if this is an angel, this is a weird way to treat it, right? Um, throwing rocks at it, throwing food at it, you know, making fun of it, treating it without reverence. And yet, at the same time, yeah, making all these conjectures about it. And at the same time, what do they want from it? What ideas do they have about this? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. They have this, these, these weird ideas, right, on page 355, right? The simplest among them thought that he should be named mayor of the world. Others of sterner mind felt that he should be promoted to the rank of five star general in order to win all wars. Some visionaries hoped that he could be put out to stud in order to implant on Earth a race of winged wise men who could take charge of the universe. Okay, so mayor of the world, winged wise men who could take charge of the universe, five star general. What is it they want from the angel? Yeah, take charge and solve our problems, right? Although they have a really, really weird way of asking him to do it. Yeah, these are all positions of authority. They want to put the angel in charge. And he'll solve everything. He'll fix everything. But the people who come to him with problems, right, he doesn't fix those problems. He just makes them weirder. And what about, where do we see other authority figures here in the story? So I think we have identified an interesting strand here, right? This idea through this treatment of authority. So the church, Father? Yeah, we have Father Gonzaga is the representative of the church, right? And how effective is Father Gonzaga? Yeah, not especially effective, right? On the one hand, um, he is coming at the angel, as we noted, with some fairly dumb assumptions. It's like, well, if it can't speak Latin, clearly it's not an angel. And does Father Gonzaga himself actually have the authority to declare whether this is or is not an angel? No, he has to write to Rome to get the authority, right? So he's part of a chain of command. All right, page 355. Nevertheless, he promised to write a letter to his bishop so that the latter would write to his primate, so that the latter would write to the supreme pontiff in order to get the final verdict from the highest courts. So he has to write to the next guy up the chain who has to write to the next guy up the chain, who has to write to the Pope. And then only the Pope can decide by writing to each person back down the link of the chain, right? So what kind of a view of hierarchy is this? It shows Father Gonzaga thinks more highly of himself than possibly he should. Well, he knows his place in the hierarchy, right? He knows that he's at the bottom of the chain here as the simple parish priest and he can't directly contact the Pope. So is, is it Father Gonzaga that's being made fun of here, or the chain of hierarchy itself? It's kind of like satire-ish, like towards the chain. Yeah, it's like this, this is silly, right? Why should he have to write to all of these people? Why should he have to write to this person who has to write to this person who has to write to this person 
just to determine whether this or is not an angel, right? And when he does hear back from them, is the grand authority of the church actually helpful? Father Gonzaga held back the crowd's frivolity with formulas of maidservant inspiration while awaiting the arrival of the final judgment on the nature of the captive. But the mail from Rome showed no sense of urgency. They spent their time finding out if the prisoner had a navel, if his dialect had any connection with Aramaic, how many times he could fit on the head of a pin, or whether he wasn't just a Norwegian with wings. These meager letters might have come and gone until the end of time if a providential event had not put an end to the priest's tribulations. So all he gets when he writes to the supreme authorities is more questions, right? They don't actually help him identify this phenomenon. They don't actually help him provide, create any sort of context for this. And they're not just questions, right? They're inane questions. So do we see here a view developing, a consistent view developing in the story about the nature of authority? What do you think? What sort of attitude does the story seem to be taking towards authority? Yeah, authority is a joke, right? There's no particularly good reason to follow any of these authority figures. Right? The angel can't actually solve your problems, nor can Father Gonzaga, right? If he could have done it, he would have done it already. Right? He's already in the village when the angel gets there, and the people are poor and the village is infested with crabs, right? So this desire for the people to, this desire on the part of the people to submit, right? The weird thing about this, the thing that's kind of hard to reconcile about this discourse of authority here, at least for me, right? The people want to submit to some authority figure, but at the same time, yeah, their submission takes a really, really weird form, right? They want to submit and to mock and accuse and punish at the same time. So what do we do with that? This is actually something you could probably build a thesis around, build an argument around. Yeah, Capriana. Okay, like, to me, what I think about it kind of goes back to, like, um, like, what is it? Like, the idea of, like, the Lord of the Rings, like, the Lord of the and, and yeah, if, if we look like it's in, in some of the gospel narratives, right? Yeah, there is an, in addition to the stoning and the poking with spears and things like that, you know, he has to wear the crown of thorns, right? And there's the, you know, king of the Jews sign posted up above him and it's all mocking. So yeah, that this, this idea of in some ways like affirming authority by making fun of it, a sort of martyrdom of the silent authority figure so yeah, there could yeah there could be a kind of biblical reference at work there. I think I, I, I think there is yeah, um, but I mean especially given that this is an angel right, or at the very least an old Norwegian with wings. But oh sure yeah 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 go for it. I mean I was just because in the Old Testament uh, mm -hmm. when the Israelites they had come out of captivity they eventually they were leaving to God for a king. Uh -huh. he, he said, well, since they want one, I'll, I'll, I'll give them one. And right. as soon as that king started to diminish in, uh, in the people's eyes, they were among the first to undermine him mm -hmm. in favor of a King David. Sure, right. Okay, okay. You're, right, you're talking about right in the book of Samuel, yeah, the anointing of Saul right. as king of the Israelites. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think that yeah, we could find a chain probably of biblical references. You could probably find a chain of references from uh, mythology as well. But yeah, I, I think we are seeing a sort of a similar sort of phenomenon here, right? Now, one other thing that I'll add to this, um, just to help contextualize the story, this might help bring some of these strands together. Um, Marquez 
is from Colombia. What's that? That's just that's just a region predominantly Catholic. Uh, yeah, it's a predominantly Catholic, um, and politically divided, right? You know, there is on the one hand, um, there's the government that calls itself legitimate that governs from Bogota, and there's a sort of rebel government that governs the rural areas. Um, and doesn't accept the authority of Bogota. So we're looking at a nation that has for a long time been politically divided between state authority and those outside the ma major cities who refuse to accept the state's authority. Now, the style that Marquez writes in the genre he writes in is usually called magic realism. And in a magic realist work, you will typically find supernatural events or sort of fantasy elements. related in a very matter-of-fact, almost journalistic style in a kind of realist, otherwise realistic, everyday world. No, that would be straight up science fiction because what Wells is doing, right, what Wells is doing is usually like the, the super science or the alien being, right, is an invading force, like it's disruptive. It's something that destroys um, or threatens to destroy. Um, it really doesn't um, it give an opinion, it's just relating to facts. Yeah, pretty much. It, it, it doesn't um, align you for or against, okay. say, the alien force in quite the same way. Ma like, in magic realism, probably the best way to put it, supernatural things just happen as a matter of course, and everyone accepts that they happen. I mean, we can see with Elisenda and Pelayo, right, when they first find the old man washed up on the shore, right, they looked at him so long and so closely that Pelayo and Elisenda very soon overcame their surprise, and in the end found him familiar, right? They assimilate this weird supernatural happening into their everyday world. It's like, okay, yes, this is within the realm of possibility of things that can happen, right? That's kind of how magic realism works. Now, magic realist writers um, tend to come from countries that have had recent experience of totalitarianism or other kinds of political crisis. Uh, so, like other writers who work in this style, uh, will be people like uh, Milan Kundera, uh, who's Czech, Salman Rushdie, uh, who is from India, and who started writing in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, when Indira Gandhi's government uh, was instituting repressive measures. Uh, one of the inventors of the movement, one of the first people to work in the style really is the, the German writer Gunter Grass in the 1950s. Um, after his own country's recent, uh, shall we say, experiment with totalitarian government. Right, so, yeah, the writers who work in the style tend to come from countries that have had recent political crises, particularly crises that are related in some way to totalitarianism and to excessive government authority. And so, in part, yeah, we, we could make an argument here, we could work out a thesis here about the nature of authority in this text, right? That authority can, I don't know, have, is, is the angel's authority, can it ever be made legitimate? No, because the angel can't actually respond to the people, right? Just as the pontiff, the, just as the pope, can't respond directly to the people. 
he has to respond through a chain of emissaries. And by the time the message gets back from him, it's so garbled that no one can get it. So what's the ultimate fate of the angel and what might it have to do with the argument we're developing about authority? What happens to the angel at the end of the story? It flies away. Flies away, right? It's gone. And how does Elisenda feel about that? She watches the yeah, she watch, she feels happy that it's gone, right? If you look on page 359, she kept watching him even when she was through cutting the onions. And she kept on watching until it was no longer possible for her to see him, because then he was no longer an annoyance in her life, but an imaginary dot on the horizon of the sea. So once this imaginary potential authority figure is gone, and what has the angel been up to all this time for the past, uh, since his chicken coop collapsed? He's been hiding. Yeah, um, th th yeah th that's actually part of another strand that I think we could tease out in a moment here. Um, the idea of like, the relationship between the angel and the child. But what's he been doing in their house? Yeah, he's everywhere, right? Everywhere they go, there's the damn angel again, right? They shoo him out of one room, and he appears in another. Right, much like a repressive authority insinuates itself into your life, right? And you can't get rid of it. All right, so that's one direction we could go in dissecting the story, right? That's sort of an example of one strand you could use to build a paper, to build a thesis about the story, right? Now, you started us down another road a second ago, Grace, and you're talking about the relationship between the angel and the child. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit, please? Well, they said that they thought he'd never there to, like, take the sick kid up to heaven. Yeah. But the kid got better, and the angel didn't believe. Yeah, the, where did they get the idea that the angel's there for the child? Yeah, we have this old neighbor woman, right? Wise old neighbor lady. And can we can somebody read that passage for us? Like where, where she first tells them what it is. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the angel she regards as an angel of death, right? But what's weird about this presentation of an angel of death? Well, he's old himself. Yeah, and he's weak, right? Yeah, he would think at the, at the very least it would be scary, right? But this is, it's old and it's so weak that the rain knocked him down, right? So weak that he couldn't even accomplish his mission. Now, what does the old neighbor woman think should be done with the angel? What's well, the merciful idea they come up with later? Yeah, Matthew. She wanted to have the townspeople kill the angel because they could, it, because she believes that the angel was a part of a divine conspiracy. Of uh huh. Yeah. Ah, it's an angel. Club it. Club it. Club it. Right. This is not the way we generally regard um, the normal treatment of angels. Right. Right. It's an angel. Kill it. Seems to us like an odd response. Well, what else about like a. You know, we've got an old man here who speaks incomprehensible gibberish. He's weak. What else about him might seem to be related to the idea of death? Yeah, he's got parasites in his wings. Good. He's covered with parasites. 
What else? What? How else are his wings described? What kind of wings does he have? Like beautiful dove's wings? Buzzard, Buzzard wings, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, also, like, I mean, what's what's a buzzard? Yeah, exactly. We're talking, we're talking about a carrion bird here. Good. Yes, buzzards form other dead things. Mm hmm Yeah, it feasts on the dead, right? It performs a very, very useful ecological function, right? Right, not to knock the buzzard. They're very, very important in the circle of life. But you don't, want, you don't want to keep them as pets, right? And when you see them feasting on something in the road, you usually walk the other way. I usually have to try to drag my dog away because she, wants, she tends to want it too. If we look at the way he is described as he is learning to fly again, we see a similar reference. Yep, scarecrow feathers. Clumsily flops around the lawn like what? The risky flapping of a senile vulture. So there is this whole discourse, this whole strand of things related death, dying, and carrying around the angel, right? Now, when does the angel first appear? What has Pelayo been doing? Killing crabs. He's been killing crabs, right? And throwing the corpses back out into the sea. So we can look at this in two ways. There seems to be a parallel development between the angel and the child, right? The angel gets sicker, the child gets better. We could also look at this in terms of the presence or absence of the crabs, right? When the angel shows up, there are lots of crabs. Lots of dead things, lots of carrion. Are there still any crabs around at the end of the story? So what are these sort of two possible explanations for the angel's presence give us. Right, on the one hand, is he there for the crabs? Is he, is he there for the child? Is this in fact decidable? Can we... Yeah, because he's incomprehensible, because he can't speak. Well, he can speak, he just can't be understood. We can't determine what his purpose there is, right? So we can't determine whether this is, in fact, some sort of carrion eating angel of death or some sort of angel of healing who has brought this gift to the family, to the child, that they can't really repay. Now, yeah, Cabriana. They said that the um, child had Mm -hmm. because they it was due to the, stench. the stench of the crabs, yeah. Okay, good. So there is actually perhaps a relationship between the carrion, the dead crabs, right? And the child's state of health. Yeah, it says they got chicken pox at the same time. Uh-huh. Yep, they get the chicken pox together, the doctor examines them both. But in both cases, right, what's really um, the difference in the conditions, right, the difference in the living conditions is crabs versus no crabs, right? Disgusting dead pests 
versus no disgusting dead pests. So one could make the argument that it is, in fact, the angel's carrion consuming tendency that, in fact, leads to the child's cure rather than any sort of divine intervention. All right. So that's two possible arguments we could make with this material, right? These are two directions we could take it in. What else you got? Yeah, Grace, keep going. It's kind of like they kind of present why the angel is like a spotted show in a carnival. Okay, yeah, there's that carnival circus theme as well, right? Good. All right, so talk me through that. Um, it, well, it makes a lot. I mean, it talks about the, like, the carnival coming to town and it directs the attention away from the, uh -huh. um, away from the angel. And then it's saying, like, the family starts making money, actual money off of Yeah. The On the one hand, yeah, this carnival attractions become a source of income for Elisenda and Pelayo. The angel as carnival attraction, right? Now, what sort of carnival attraction would the angel be? Where would you find the angel in a carnival? Or something like the angel? What's the Sideshow, yes. Right? He would probably be in the sideshow or the freak show. And why do people go to a sideshow? To see something supernatural. Yeah, to see something abnormal, right? A spider woman. Yeah. Perry Fair. Oh, there, there is a spider woman at the Perry Fair? Yeah, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, we actually we, we, we sort of, we missed the uh, the sideshow portion of it uh, this year. I mean, like so, some of those carnival attractions. Like I grew up um, not far from Bloomberg, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, where there's another big fair um, every year, and those same sideshow attractions go all over the country to every little country fair, <laughs> and some of them have been doing this for as long as I've been alive, right? It's not the same Spider Woman anymore. There's the one that's the, the headless girl mm -hmm. as well, right? She was beheaded in a car wreck, but oh, is somehow still giant, alive. Or, a there's a Yeah, I, I think it's stuffed now, but. <laughs> <laughs> I've never gone to see Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there, there's a, a snake woman, right? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, like, you, you want to go and see something that science has no good explanation for, right? Something that should not be. And this kind of points at one of the things that the angel and the spider woman actually have in common. They're not just abnormal, right? They're not just sideshow freaks. How else are they similar? Yeah, half human, half what? Well, every every component of the Spider Girl seems to be mortal, right? How is having a spider body similar to having wings, while being otherwise human? You're half human, half what? Half animal, yeah. They're both human-animal hybrids. So does that lessen their humanity? Well, what do you uh, what do you do you think it lessens the humanity of either one? I would say. Okay. I mean, not less than him, but maybe detract from his humanity by the fact that he's just mm -hmm. not clean. You know, he can't be 
understood. Yeah. And he's walking around with parasites on him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that would detract more than, you know, because people are generally familiar with angels. Sure. But I think that would, would be, have more of a negative, like, animalistic connotation mm -hmm. than the actual weight. Okay, the fact that he can't communicate with anyone. Would have would be the more animalistic thing than the actual wings. What were you gonna say, Cabriana? Okay. Um, on page three fifty seven. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And the angel, and they said, by a spectrum like that, for so much summer too, and with such a big formation, was mm -hmm. bound to defeat without even trying. There are about how two angels who thought she was the dying to look at mortals. Mm hmm. So yeah, how how is the spectacle of the spider girl? different from the spectacle of the angel. you got this angel who they have to figure out what to feed him through trial and error, right? Um, for some reason, they think he eats mothballs. And the only things that he will actually consume, the only thing he'll actually consume is eggplant mush. What about the spider girl? Yeah, you can feed her, right? And she eats nice, good, hearty meatballs. Right, you can toss them into her mouth. And what else can she do that the angel can't? She can, ex yeah, she can explain herself, right? She can explain what happened to her. She can tell her story. You know exactly why she became what she became. And let's look briefly at her explanation of her history right here on 357. It so happened that during those days, right, even a kind of like biblical sounding opening to the paragraph, right? <laughs> Among so many other carnival attractions, there arrived in town the traveling show of the woman who had been changed into a spider for having disobeyed her parents. The admission to see her was not only less than the admission to see the angel, but people were permitted to ask her all manner of questions about her absurd state and to examine her up and down so that no one would ever doubt the truth of her horror. She was a frightful tarantula the size of a ram and with the head of a sad maiden. What was most heartrending, however, was not her outlandish shape, but the sincere affliction with which she recounted the details of her misfortune. While still practically a child, she had sneaked out of her parents' house to go to a dance, and, while it, and without permission, wait, right, and while she was coming back to the woods after having danced all night without permission, a fearful thunderclap rent the sky in two, and through the crack came the lightning bolts of brimstone that changed her into a spider. So the transgression for which she is changed into a spider, right, what did she do? She disobeyed. she disobeyed authority, yes. She disobeyed her parents, right? We can connect this back to our earlier authority discourse, right? If she disobeyed her parents and was changed into a spider. But the fact that she can communicate this, right, that she can tell a story with a moral lesson, right, a lesson that others can take away from this, right, this has more human truth than the spectacle of the angel. So does humanity in the story seem to be dependent upon human form? Yeah. And in fact, physically, she's less human than the angel, right? The angel just has wings, buzzard wings, vulture wings. You know, the only part of her that's human, that remains human, physically, is her head. But because she's able to make connections with other people, she is thus more human, her spectacle possesses more human truth than the angel. Now, can we then apply this to the villagers and their treatment of the angel? To what extent do the villagers act with humanity towards the angel? Yeah, they treat him like an animal, right? They prod him, they poke him, um, they throw things at him. 
you look on page 356, right, the only time they succeeded in arousing him was when they burned his side with an iron for branding steers, for he had been motionless for so many hours that they thought he was dead. You know, this seems rather an extreme measure for waking someone up, right? You could just shake him. You don't have to poke him with a red hot branding iron. Yeah, there, there are other, there are even other ways that are kind of mean to wake someone up, right? That don't involve actually burning them. He awoke with a start, ranting in his hermetic language and with tears in his eyes, and he flapped his wings a couple of times, which brought on a whirlwind of chicken dung and lunar dust and a gale of panic that did not seem to be of this world. Although many thought that his reaction had been one not of rage but of pain, from then on they were careful not to annoy him, because the majority understood that his passivity was not that of a hero taking his ease, but that of a cataclysm in repose. So there's something that is also potentially terrifying about the angel. Right? They recognize potential for danger in the angel. Right? He can't communicate his intentions. They don't know why he's there. Is he there to take the child? Is he there to initiate some sort of natural disaster? Who knows, right? Because he can't communicate, because his intentions cannot be discerned, he's kind of cut off from the human community, despite the obvious humanity of most of his body, right? All right, so. This binary, this is another thread, the human-animal dichotomy. This is another thing that you could build an argument around, right? Um, so, if any, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Because I feel like we've actually done some pretty good work on this. Um, uh, you guys have actually picked out some really, really good stuff. Um, I'm really impressed with the way you've spotted and connected some of these dots. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to let you go a little bit early. Um, we're going to be doing the Edwidge Danticat story next time, Wallfire Rising, and then that's it for fiction. Uh, remember, so remember you have until next Friday to do any posts on fiction at all, any discussions or posts. How many, like, what's the maximum of like, Four. Four, yep. Four poetry, four fiction, two drama. So you should have ten total for full credit.